Hey, hey folks, and welcome to my video covering the NES games of 1986. In the last video, I decided I was going to start a massively insane project by playing and talking about every NES game year by year. I think the 1985 video is pretty good. If you haven't watched it, I highly recommend that you do. The format for this video is similar. I played all the NES games that were released in 1986. I played each for about 10 minutes, and then I wrote about my experience. This video will take you through all 19 games, and then at the end, I'll be ranking my favorites before we wrap up. I put a lot of effort into this one. I think it's even better than the 1985 video. So if you'd like to help me support the project, please head on over to my Patreon. Links are below. Now, without further ado, let's talk about Donkey Kong. I had the Donkey Kong Classics cartridge as a kid. It had both Donkey Kong and Donkey Kong Jr. on it. I was never fantastic at the games, but I got pretty good. I mean, I never reached a kill screen, but I knew the ins and outs and loved both games. It's been a long time since I last played Donkey Kong, and it's nice to know my knowledge and game skills haven't completely atrophied. I managed to get to cycle 3 of the game before my lives ran out. It's funny how it's the little things you remember. I always loved the weird squeaking sound of Mario's run. Long into my 20s, my brain would randomly play the intro music of Donkey Kong, and then I'd emulate the squeaking. Do 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 do. <laughs> I love the sound of the hammer hitting the barrels, but I never liked the falling sound of the weird springboards in stage 2. I also remember how finicky Mario's jump could be. You need to be level when making a leap or else you're going to lose a life. Precision is important. In stage 1 I had to be right in front of the ladders to climb them. I was expecting some leeway from the game. I mean, I'm pretty much in the right spot, but no, that's not how these old games work. Oh well, you gotta take the games as they are, right? I like while it's an old arcade game and points are important, the reason I grab the hammer is more for the satisfaction of annihilating my enemies. Even if they're just barrels. I've been told that the Famicom was designed to recreate Donkey Kong. It's a faithful port. The game has a lot of character and I still find it enjoyable to play. It was getting tougher each cycle too, and I felt a sense of accomplishment each time I made it to a new stage. I'm never going to want to master Donkey Kong, but I could see myself playing it and having a good time for years to come. Not only did I have Donkey Kong Jr. as part of the Donkey Kong Classics package as a kid, one of my earliest gaming memories is having the Donkey Kong Jr. game and watch. I played that thing for hours. I even remember hearing about the dreaded F word on the playground and then yelling it at the game in the backseat of my dad's car one day. What followed was not pleasant. So, in a way, my memories of Donkey Kong Jr. are more vivid than that of Donkey Kong. It's been about just as long since I last played DKJ, so how does it hold up after all this time? Well first, I love the vine climbing mechanic. How if you use two hands, you shimmy up the vines, but you can shimmy down faster on one. I like moving between vines hand over hand. It has a simplistic Tarzan feel to it. The levels also feel more like strange obstacle courses than they did in Donkey Kong, especially level 3. The sound of the electricity is something that's imprinted in my mind. When the level started and I heard it, I said, oh yeah, that's where that sound is from. I like the twist of playing as DK's son and having to rescue your dad from the evil Mario. I even think the last stage is more climactic than the last stage of Donkey Kong. 
But man, level two, the bane of my existence. The top half is fine, it's easy to dodge the birds, but that bottom half? Yeesh! It's so easy to hit your head on the platforms above, but then timing traversal through that vine conveyor belt never goes smoothly. I got to cycle 2 during this play, and on both cycles level 2 was where I lost lives. All the other levels went more smoothly. I enjoy the changes made for Donkey Kong Jr., but if I had to choose, I'm always going to prefer to play Donkey Kong. I never really liked Mario Brothers. I think it's always been because I played Super Mario Brothers first. After Super, how can you go back to regular? There's a petrol joke in there somewhere. Anyways, I tried to keep an open mind when approaching Mario Brothers this time around, and nope, still don't like it. Originally, it was because I couldn't jump on the enemy's heads, but I knew that going into this play session, so my dislike is all in the way Mario controls. He's far too slippery. It's too easy to slide around, either off a ledge or into an enemy. To jump to a higher ledge feels a lot like the jump from Ice Climber, where the edge detection is just off enough to be noticeable and annoying. Funnily enough, with how hard the game is, I had my best attempt when trying game mode B, which spawns fireballs if you're on any level for more than a few seconds. I started to learn what I could jump over, what to chase after, and what to leave alone, waiting for it to enter the bottom pipe and reappear at the top of the stage. The POW block wasn't really needed, I just hit it a couple times so I had footage of it. This might be more enjoyable two-player, but while it's not as bad as I remember, I definitely have no desire to play it again anytime soon. Back in the early days of the channel, when I was doing a mix of arcade let's plays and retrospectives, I played Donkey Kong 3. I made a joke about how the game was about blasting smoke at DK's taint. It's not an inaccurate reading. Donkey Kong 3 is weird. Mario is an exterminator now? And Donkey Kong is trying to use swarms of insects to steal Mario's potted plants? What? I've heard this referred to as a Space Invaders clone, and while I can see the similarities, blasting incoming insectoids, it really isn't. I mean, putting down the entire swarm is one way to complete the level. No more bugs means DK can't get the plants. The other more satisfying way, though, is to blast his backside until he's at the top of the vine, fleeing to the next stage. It's tough, because Mario's spray can isn't that powerful. If you can get DK up the vine enough to drop the super spray, then things become a lot easier. With the super spray, you can often end the level before the swarms even reach Mario. The game is hard though. Both button spray and the up button jumps. This makes things awkward, as well as Mario being very stiff to control. It's just not fun to move around in Donkey Kong 3. The player needs great spatial awareness and foresight to not move into the path of a bug or an incoming coconut while keeping the pressure on DK's coconuts. I can see why this DK outing isn't as fondly remembered as the original. Like basic math in my Atari video, I don't really have much to say about console games that are geared more towards edutainment than actually being a game. Games A and B of Donkey Kong Jr. Math are an interesting two-player mode, where you're fighting to get the right numbers and arithmetic to reach the number DK is holding. Then there's a math drill section, where you choose which kind of problem you'd like to solve, and then have to solve 10 of them by climbing the vines to the right number. As math programs go, this isn't too bad, but let's move on. So the story goes, Shigeru Miyamoto wanted to make a Popeye video game, 
but Nintendo couldn't get the license, so he made Donkey Kong. Maybe the added sway of their arcade success changed the minds of King Features Syndicate, because here we have a Popeye game. I mean, the ingredients are kind of the same. We have a hero trying to get to his beloved, and a big hulking brute in the way. Instead of a hammer, Popeye has his spinach, which turns the tables, and like the hammer in Donkey Kong, it brings the game to a halt as you chase down Brutus for retribution. This is more of an annoyance because the goal is not to reach the top of the stage in Popeye. Instead, Olive Oil is throwing down her affection. In the first stage, it's hearts. In the second stage, it's music notes. And in the third stage, when she's been captured, it's the letters that form the word help. If Olive's thrown elements reach the bottom of the stage, the music changes and they start to flash, so I imagine you lose a life if they stay there too long. I never lost a life this way, but I got pummeled by running into Brutus and the Buzzard many a time. Brutus is tough. If he's on the same stage as Popeye, he throws bottles. If he's on a stage above, he can jump down on top of you more than once in a row, and if he's on a stage below, he can punch through the floor. Game Mode B gives you more to watch out for as the sea hag is throwing the skulls. I found out the skulls can be punched, and I wonder if Brutus' bottles can be smashed in this way too. There's a lot to take in. I couldn't believe how many hearts I had to collect in stage 1, but once I got into a rhythm, I knew how I could avoid Brutus for the most part and go about my business. Stage 2 is a little weirder, but there's not as many notes to collect. Stage 3 is rough because of the buzzard. I wasn't able to finish it. After a couple of game overs, I was enjoying myself. Popeye requires your full attention to collect everything and avoid the baddies. There are other ways to take Brutus out of play, but I did find since the spinach stops the collection aspect, to just be on my toes and try to collect all of the missives as soon as possible, even though chasing down Brutus is quite satisfying. Popeye is challenging, but in a fun way, and the music's not half bad either. Pretty good for a licensed game, wink. I love Balloon Fight. On my Dreamcast, I had an emulation disc with every NES game on it, and Balloon Fight was a two-player experience my friends and I returned to time and time again. It was actually a bit odd this time, playing that first mode without a second player. Of course, when there's two players, you do have to watch out for a friendly fire, that you don't accidentally pop one of your buddy's balloons. It's kind of a part co-op, part competitive game. Who can score the most points? Of course, the way we played, we were just trying to clear the screens as quick as possible. And in the bonus stage, one of us stayed on the right and one of us stayed on the left. It allowed for a perfect score and we both got the bonus. The thing I find fascinating about loving Balloon Fight so much is how difficult it is to control. I mean, the game is obviously inspired by Joust, swapping out flying ostriches for balloon men. And just like that game, controlling your character is rough. One of the adjectives used to describe game feel that's loose and unresponsive is floaty. And I guess here the adjective is thematically appropriate. Keeping your balloon man in the air can be exhausting, tapping wildly and making small directional adjustments to not lose control or find yourself under an enemy, allowing them to pop one of your balloons. Oh, and woe to you that only has one balloon to work with. The amount of button tapping to gain altitude just increased tenfold. But despite all that, there is something compelling about the small stages, the increase in enemies and their color-coded ferocity, how the clouds shoot more lightning, and how the spinny bumpers you might know from Smash Brothers introduce themselves. I made it to stage 11, which is pretty good for not having played the game in years. For footage's sake, I tried a few rounds of the single player obstacle course run. It's not as enjoyable as the main game, but at least you get to hear that delightful music while making your way through the stars. Oh. 
Oh wow, Gumshoe is unique. It's a platformer where the jump is controlled by the zapper. And despite the fact it doesn't quite work, meaning it's frustrating to play, I like it. The goal of the game is to find the diamonds. I think retrieving the diamonds must be remembered because once I got the first diamond, it was no longer there on subsequent plays as the game progressed from the city to a Wild West motif. Okay, so shooting your gumshoe makes him jump, and he can jump in the air for as long as you keep shooting him. Left to his own devices, he'll hop up small ledges, but plummet straight down if he falls off a cliff. Collecting balloons gives you the bullets to keep firing. You can shoot most of the hazards on stage, like the incoming bottles, cars, and birds, but juggling trying to fire at incoming obstacles while making sure the gumshoe is not going to walk into danger is where the frustration lies. For example, during this highway section, if you find yourself on the bottom, you're pretty much screwed. Cars to the left of me, bottles to the right, and here I am, stuck in the middle with shoe. Gumshoe will likely be the most interesting game I talk about in this video. Mac Rider is tough. Well, at least when I was trying to figure out how the heck the game worked. If there's a rider in your rear view mirror, there's a 9 in 10 chance that you're going to get rammed and explode into a million pieces. It was only during the solo run when I was trying out all the game modes that I realized I could shift up gears using the D-pad. Only top speed will keep the other riders from turning you into data confetti. And that makes navigating the twists and turns of the racetrack a nail-biting affair. There are water spills, oil spills, barrels, rocks, and then the green bikers that can't be shot and will try and ram you off the road. You can return the favor, tapping them into one of the many hazards, and it's satisfying. But you don't get to enjoy your victory because there's always something else to worry about. The music is neat, and the game looks nice, I especially like the wheat fields of level 1, but I found Mac Rider too intense to enjoy my time with it. My memories of playing Urban Champion are that it was very simplistic and not that good. Well, it's definitely simplistic. I think this was mainly made for two players, that push and pull of trying to land face or belly shots with a friend while seeing who's dodging is better. It's really like a proto-fighting game. The point is to do enough damage consistently to push your opponent off the edge of the street block so you can move to the next block and repeat the process for as long as possible. Against the computer, I found some fights challenging in terms of how often the enemy blocked and dodged followed by a foe I could punch in the face over and over again. Every now and then the police drive by and the two combatants act like they're minding their own business. Of course, if the timer or your stamina run out, you will be arrested, but if you beat the entire block, a mother will throw confetti out her window. There is more nuance to the push and pull of Urban Champion than I remember there being, but I didn't enjoy my time with it. Oh man, as a wrestling fan, I was looking forward to this. There were so many wrestling games in the arcades and on those early consoles. And yes, my memory tells me that none of them were that good. But I want to believe. Tag Team Wrestling confounded me even after I looked at the manual. Apparently the number of button presses correspond to what movie a wrestler does, with special moves being the most button presses. But any time I got near my opponent, it seems their moves took precedence over anything I did. I like that you gain energy when not tagged in so it's easy to recuperate, but your opponents are doing the same. It also seems the timer plays a role because I got pinned when there was less than 60 seconds left in the match. It didn't look or sound too bad, but I just couldn't figure out how to play tag team wrestling.
There's a joy in loading up a new NES game unsure of what you're going to find. Chubby Cherub was unlike anything I might have been expecting. We play a... Chubby Cherub. As an angel, they can fly, but only sometimes. And liftoff is tricky. And it might have to do with food or lollipops. As we fly around the town, we eat everything we can get our mouths on. Some of it gives us power pellets. We can shoot hearts to dispatch all the dogs that are coming after us, with some of them barking, which was what I died to most. Finally, after flying around eating for a while, we start searching the windows of an apartment building for the face that showed up at the start of the level. We found this person. Well done. On to the next stage. And that's the game. The dogs get tougher, birds are introduced, and that same short tune loops over and over again, driving me mad. What an odd game. I will say that after playing it, I told my friend Robbie, and he mentioned that it was originally a licensed anime game, but the sprites were changed for the US market. I bet this is not going to be the last time we see this happening. So in 1986, we get not one bad wrestling game, but two. I'm pretty sure there's none left, but maybe Ghosts and Goblins is different than how I remember it. The problem with Muscle is it's all dependent on the random power pellets. As it is, there's a rudimentary German suplex, clothesline, and dropkick, but to pull any of them off consistently seems to be a case of luck rather than skill. I say that, but when I finally won my first match, I was able to stunlock the enemy with a torrent of German suplexes, so perhaps there is a bit of skill involved. Anyways, my point is, these base moves can whittle away your opponent's health, but once you gain the power pellet, not only do you move faster, but you can unleash your finishing move, which all but guarantees a victory. The characters are all caricatures, and I'm pretty sure this game is licensed off the wrestling manga and anime which I know as Ultimate Muscle. I remember catching a few episodes when I moved back to the US in the early 2000s. Maybe this game fares better two-player, where your buddy is in the same boat as you are, but when I finally gained victory, it was not triumphant. I was just wondering what BS the game would throw at me in Stage 2. Ninja Kid has an overworld, with levels randomly placed around it. Levels have different goals. One of them might have a basic kill so many enemies goal, but then you might need to collect ghosts or light candles. In the candle mission, I thought I had to keep away from the little flame following me, but it turned out to be my friend. If you accomplish a goal or a flute appears, you can either warp out of the level or to a boss. My guess is you need to defeat the three gray pillars before the other two open up on the map. And the Guerrilla Warfare level was always the death of me, with its own ninjas and jumping monks. The game is competent. It doesn't feel good to play, but it's not restrictive. I find the different levels intriguing and think it looks fine, but man I wish the music loops ran a little longer. Okay, let me get my negatives out of the way first on this one. The sound design makes this excruciating for me to play. I can handle no music, but those high-pitched tings were sending me over the edge. You can hold down the fire button, but since you can shoot more frequently by tapping the button as fast as possible, it's more advantageous to do that, wearing out your hand as you play level by level. There are power upgrades, but they seem to be random, and I never understood how to trigger them to appear. I did love the upgrade with the two planes on either side of me. That really helped cover the screen. Screen coverage is needed, because it doesn't take long for the screen to be littered with enemy planes. Some of the larger ones come from below, so I can easily see a player losing a life to bad luck. The game featured quite a bit of slowdown when there were too many enemies, 
But for me, that's not a negative. I love slowdown in NES games. It adds a sense of, oh, shit is getting real. The game is having a hard time keeping up. This would be really fun with two players and the NES Advantage controller, so you could turn the turbo on and just hold down the button, firing away like your plane has a real machine gun. Talk about an onslaught. The enemy just keeps on coming. It's really annoying firing in eight directions on the D-pad. My fingers were getting worn out and I never even made it past level two. I have to wonder if there are any other weapons or if the pea shooter and the imprecise grenades are all the players have at their disposal as the difficulty ratchets up level by level. I think a second player is almost mandatory for watching each other's backs but then I wonder if that adds more enemies on screen. The only respite the player has is when the level is over. I like how enemies hide in trenches and behind rocks can be taken out with a grenade and how they flee once you run past their position. I wasn't prepared for losing a life by falling in a ditch after the game respawned me right on the edge of one, but I didn't make that mistake again. I think overall there's too many cheap tactics. Not only having the player die if they come into contact with an enemy soldier, but motorbikes roaring across the screen, choke points with bazooka men on the other side, and then the guys with shields. It all seems too much, and while I worked my way past these barriers, I can't say I enjoyed myself. When people think of Ghosts and Goblins, they usually think about its brutal difficulty. And while it is brutally difficult, I'm amazed that this nest port of the arcade classic comes with allowances. The game allows you to continue at the last checkpoint once you lose all your lives. Now these checkpoints are few and far between, and I wouldn't be surprised if you only got so many continues, but the gesture is appreciated. I managed to get to level 2 with that assistance. For an early NES game, I had a lot of fun with Ghosts and Goblins. I think it looks good, it plays nicely, and while the sound effects are a little sharp to my ears, I love that theme song. Hopefully there's more music as the game progresses, because I was a little disappointed to hear the same music again once level 2 started. Enemies come from everywhere. Early on, it's easy to see the zombies pop out of the ground, but once the beige spear-throwing ghosts in the forest come out to play, it's a crapshoot as to if you'll be able to survive. Hesitation caused my death more than anything else. Just keep moving forward, firing with wild abandon, and dodging everything you can. Hopefully, you can make it through once you start to learn the lay of the land. Getting the right weapon is important too. The default lance is good, the fire is bad, and the dagger was great. The problem is if you die holding a weapon you dislike, you'll respawn or continue with it as well. And that's on top of learning all the little tricks of each level. I played level 2 until I ran out of lives, and if the annoying little sprites weren't slaying me, it was trying to make the jump to dry land on the moving platform. I never could pull it off. So, Ghosts and Goblins is pretty great. I don't know if I have the patience to ever get through it, but while I have played games in the series before which let me know what I was in for, I wasn't expecting to enjoy myself so much. I'd say this is the first really great Capcom title for the system. Holy crap on toast is Gradius hard. I was swearing often in a oh come on way, as just brushing against the ceiling or floor of the cave destroyed my craft. And what makes it worse is dying removes all your power-ups. They're out the window, collect them again. 
I started to work out that you need to obliterate an entire squad of enemies to have a power-up appear. What's cool is that every power-up moves the bar down the bottom up one spot, so you can either grab the speed-up ability, or grab two power-ups and get missile, or three and get double. You get the picture. What this means is the player needs to be good enough to get the power-ups at every opportunity, has to have general skill in shooting and dodging enemy fire, as well as know all the little tricks to get past hard moments. I could never find a safe spot to fire from when I reached the Twin Volcanoes. One errant piece of magma would always pop off in my face. I like how the game chooses when it wants to play its music, as there's not enough memory to have the sound effects play fully when the music's going, so it shifts between the two. The music is pretty damn good though. I loved that cave theme. It'd be nice if you didn't get sent back to a checkpoint and just appeared where you died, but maybe that would make the game too easy. Grotius is hard, man. I found it harder than ghosts and goblins. I like it, but it's hard. Karate Champ is my favorite arcade game. There is something about using the combinations of two joysticks to pull off a litany of fighting game moves that has always appealed to me. I became quite proficient at the game on an emulator back in the day, using WASD and IJKL on the keyboard as the twin joystick inputs. Now, I don't think I have to tell you, but the NES does not have a controller with two joysticks. Instead, it has a D-pad and four buttons. So how was Karate Champ going to adapt itself to a new controller configuration? The answer is pretty clever. The A button pulls off a move, the B button pulls off a second move, and both buttons together pull off a third move. When pressing a direction on the D-pad, these three moves change. It takes a bit of getting used to, and it's not as responsive as I remember the joysticks being, but it does work. Obviously, I would have to play the game a lot to become intimately familiar with the moves like I was with the arcade version. But once I stopped getting my ass kicked by the computer by moving to the two-player option in order to test out the moves and see some different fighting venues, everything started to come together. I have a memory of playing this game with a friend on New Year's Eve when I was a teenager in his parents' basement. We didn't really know what we were doing, so we just kept button mashing match after match after match, going nuts when something cool happened on screen. That's my preferred way to play any fighting game actually. It's more about the company and seeing what happens than who is winning or losing. And that's one thing the NES version has over the arcade original, player vs player. I think it's a good adaptation, but as the controls aren't as responsive, and it doesn't carry the same novelty factor as two joysticks, I can't see myself spending the time that I did on the arcade version. With a friend and some time on a couch, however, I think it's a pretty good game. And it's that time again, where I arbitrarily rank the games I've just played. In the 1985 video, I decided to rank the top 10, and seeing there are 19 games released in 1986, I think I'll continue with the top 10 in this video. Now, I did get a suggestion to make this list more dramatic, so I've written a sentence or two about each entry. Let's do this! At number 10, Donkey Kong 3. I like the arcade version better, but it's such an odd Donkey Kong sequel that I feel it deserves a spot on this list. Number 9, Gumshoe! This platformer using the Nintendo Zapper doesn't quite work, but I want to applaud them for even attempting this bonkers idea in the first place. At number 8, Mario Brothers! After playing Super Mario Brothers, it's rough to go back to this initial outing, but I was enjoying myself despite its difficulty. Could that statement be foreshadowing for other games on this list? Let's see. At number 7, we have Gradius. Yes, it was foreshadowing. Gradius is tough as balls, but it's so well made I have to give it its props. 
Just shy of halfway at number six, we have Popeye. Speaking of tough, I guess I shouldn't expect anything else from a game starring such a rough and tumble sailor man. The idea of collecting Olive's missives is clever, but they don't make it easy. I'm beginning to think difficulty is a theme of 1986. At the halfway point, number five, we have ghosts and goblins. As tough as G and G is, the continues give the player hope that these obstacles can be overcome. And that theme song is still a banger. We're getting into the gems now. At number four, it's Karate Champ. I think the arcade version is better because of its control scheme. But not only are the controls adapted in a novel way, there's player versus player. Top three now, baby. Number three is Donkey Kong Jr. I love how in the Donkey Kong sequel, you have to rescue DK from the clutches of that fiendish Mario. The unique vine climbing mechanic is just icing on the cake. At number two, Donkey Kong, the original Nintendo success story. The game is still a lot of fun to play and this is a wonderful port. And finally, at numero uno, drumroll please, Balloon Fight. It doesn't matter if it's one or two players, I love how enjoyably uncomfortable it is to float around these sky islands trying to pop the balloons of your enemies. This is still one of my favorite games on the entire console. Well, that was a fun list. As alluded to in the ranking, a lot of games I found very difficult found their way into my top 10. It just goes to show that difficulty is only a detriment to a game if nothing else about it is interesting or compelling. I bet we'll see plenty of examples of such games as I continue my journey through the years of NES releases. Looking back at 1986 as a whole, things were starting to happen for the NES. Nintendo continued showing why they're the best at making games for their own systems by releasing a lot of the ports of their popular arcade titles. More importantly, 86 is the year when the third-party developers started to step up. We had Capcom and Konami make strong initial showings, as well as Data East publishing games for Technos Japan. Oh yes, and Tosei developed some games too. Nothing too great, but they will go on to make one of my favorites on the system in the years to come. It was a fun bunch of games to cover. Some of them I had never played before, and others I played once or twice years ago. It was as easily manageable as the 1985 list due to each year having under 20 games. That will not be the case for the next video. There were 53 games released for the NES in 1987. I'll get to work on that project immediately, but it might not come out for a while. Hopefully before the end of the year. Now, if you enjoyed the video and want to continue to support this project and everything else I do on the channel, why not throw a few dollars my way on Patreon? You get early access to my videos, monthly updates, and more! And with that out of the way, I'm looking forward to see what games I get to try out in 1987. The sheer amount of games is daunting, but I've been enjoying this journey every step of the way so far. So all I can do is continue to take this one game at a time. Thanks for watching everyone. I hope you're enjoying your gaming and are all having a wonderful day.